Hello everyone and welcome to Doomtober. Yes, I've stuck a bit of paper on the front of the book that says Doomtober. I went there. Anyway, can we take a moment to appreciate how messy my desk has got? This was new at the beginning of, of Inktober, or whatever it is we just did. Let's just ignore that, shall we? And have a little flick through the book, just to see. Right, so first off, we have Lightning. Am I reading this to you? I don't know. Can you hear the rain? That might make it quite as atmospheric, but the rain is going for it outside, so sorry about that. Oh dear, am I reading this out? Oh, that sounds hideous. Um, okay, so the first one was lightning, and we have a lightning tree. I can't quite remember why I came up with a lightning tree, but I did. So the story is... Huh, uh, a crackle, just one, broke the monotony of the brown sky. With the crackle came a creak, as the tree seemed to shift slightly. Another crackle, and a shot of mild blue light, lasting just the briefest of moments, at the tip of the furthest branch. Again the tree shifted in the ground, then a shot of blue, the brightest bolt, appeared from the tree's lowest branch, creating a connection to the sky. And then it was gone, as if it had never been there but replaced with another, then another, and soon sparks shots. Soon sparks and shots of light surrounded the tree. I knew I'd cock it up. Old and grizzled, creaky and complaining, the tree tried to ignore it, but it couldn't stay still any longer. But it could stay still no longer. I wrote this, people, uh, a month ago, and the lightning tree grumpily dragged its roots from the barren ground and began to shuffle forward. It didn't know what had awoken it, but it wanted to find them and express its disdain at this unscheduled movement. So there you go, we have a grumpy tree. Day one. Day two. Um, and we begin to see what my, my family are, are like. And we have existential dread with a smiley face, a flower and a heart, which is lovely. This is from my daughter. I think the first one, that is my dad. Yeah, and this is my daughter. So day two, existential dread. It was the girl who awoke the lightning tree. It had been a normal day, and that was the problem. Making her way through it, she became, fur she became further and further removed from each step. She knew it was impossible, but she could still hear the crack echoing in her head as the tiny flower's stem broke. A pale little thing, barely upright anyway, and her tread sent its petals plummeting to the coarse ground below. I may have spelt coarse wrong, just ignore spelling. I can't spell. Uh, she followed the flower's petals and sunk down to the ground, eyes wide and staring into the thunderous distance beyond her sight. I quite, I like this one. I really tried with the eyes. And for some reason I put a mask on her. Um, just because. But yeah, there you go. And this is a mistake from the next day. The um, I was practising and it came through, but we'll ignore that. Day three is feathers and we get Edmund, who's my favourite. Meanwhile, Edmund, a particularly fluffy strumple, was spending his afternoon in his favourite way by admiring the three strands of feathers that sprung from the top of his head. He would sit and stare up at them and watch as they waved to him in a calming breeze. But then a distant flash of lightning grabbed his eyes away from his delicate blue feathers and to the sky beyond. Lightning meant thunder and rain and his feathers becoming limp as the droplets attacked him. Edmund fled to his house, angry and dismayed that the sun would no longer be there, would no longer glint from his precious plumes, the clouds already gathering. Edmund, I love Edmund. Then we have um, the artist formerly known as Prince. That was my mum's, by the way, I think, feathers. She got hold of a green pen somehow. Another from my daughter, and I ended up doing two. So we, we've got the artist formerly known as Prince, but she actually wanted Prince, but she didn't want me to cop out and just draw a Prince, so she wrote that. So she actually wanted Purple Prince, so she got Purple Prince. Well, there's little Edmund. So, um, <clears throat> we're not arguing, but Edmund the Strumple's house was actually through a little wormhole he'd found one day while snuffling for snaffle fruit. He never found any snaffles because they don't exist but he liked to put maximum effort into whatever he did, so he kept looking. The wormhole he found led into the dressing room of Prince, or the artist formerly known as Prince, depending on what song the wormhole was feeling like that day. 
Prince, or the artist formerly known as Prince, was always very nice to Edmund, and Edmund appreciated this. He would watch the singer practicing and then curl up in a purple pocket to sleep. One day he even woke up on stage in this purple pocket, being gyrated around to the music. But that's another story. Prince. Then we have Eternity, which really doesn't fit. It we're not. There's a couple that we don't come back to in the story. It's just sort of you know, people are passing them. So, Edmund the Strumple unfortunately did not end up in Prince's or the artist formerly known as Prince's dressing room. This time the well, wormhole, wormhole seemed to quiver as he stepped inside it. It then flipped over and began to spin, colours bleeding into each other as Edmund tried desperately to grab at his feathers and protect them from the edges of the wormhole. It was taking him somewhere, but he was far too grumpily distracted to notice. If Edmund had looked down at any one time, he would have seen a lonely figure sitting on a long bench below him. The figure was, melt was a melting mound of something that had once been something else. A vague shape still existed, a type of person could maybe be seen if it wasn't stared at too long. The shape seemed to sink further into the bench without moving at all. Above it, a dazzling shot of colour dripped down to him. Like a rainbow had been slashed and left to bleed. It sat there, slowly looking up seeing the colours dripping, creeping closer and closer, yet never reaching the grey skin that still made the shape. Eternity dripping. It saw the wormhole curling through the colours and saw Edmund inside. If Edmund had looked down, he would have seen the shape looking like us, looking like the stare in a sad girl's eyes. Ooh, just the girl. This was, um... Not what I wanted. This stuff is you sort of drip it and it goes pshh, but it didn't work very well on this paper. That's my excuse. That's what I'm going for. Those. This was my my boyfriend's one, and this one we're back to my daughter's party time. Jesus. Oh yes. And I can't do people. So apologies to everyone. But this is party time. He's having a he's having a whale of a time. I think Jesus should. So, what are we at? Day six. Party time. Jesus. As Edmund the Strumple hurtled through the wormhole, trying to protect his feathers, the lightning tree made its way slowly and begrudgingly across the desert and on into a lush valley. He could hear the music booming as soon as it entered the valley, and it sighed deeply, making the air crackle. A cheery, bright 80s melody fought its way to the lightning tree and became unbearably loud as it came nearer. In the distance it could see a shape dancing to the tune, swinging their arms around and swaying from one foot to the other. The lightning tree sighed again. It tried to pass party time Jesus without being seen. But they are a huge tree, so it didn't work well. Party time Jesus called for the lightning tree to join him in his dance as he clicked his fingers to something putting the boom boom back into something else. Oh, I do amuse myself. But the lightning tree stopped only for a moment, looked at Party Time Jesus, then moved on, ever so slightly quicker. Party Time Jesus shrugged and smiled and continued his dance, partying the day away. So, there you go. <clears throat> Party Time Jesus, everybody. Moving swiftly on. This one, I like this one. I like this idea with just the black and one colour and you, the shading. Um... It's not, you know, ideal, but I did my best and I'm quite happy with this one. But this is Nature, which is my boyfriend's one again. Um, as the lightning tree made its way through the valley, Edmund overtook it, hurtling along the wormhole above. Then suddenly the wormhole let him go and he found himself lying on the ground, counting his feathers. Next to him a girl sat, staring ahead of her at the empty field that stretched out in front. A boring field ringed with far-off houses and a sparse sprinkle of trees. Edmund was about to sit up and begin a search for his lunch when the girl reached out to a tiny bedraggled flower in front of her, a sad little thing. She held it in the palm of her hand and stared down at it. Edmund felt himself lifting up and rolled his eyes, sighing. He felt a branch beneath him growing and reaching up to the sky. He saw other growths around him sprouting from the ground. Soon he and the girl were surrounded by strange, twisted trees 
their branches reaching down to her as she held the flower, oblivious to it all. Edmund still wanted his lunch. And then, day eight, we lucked out. Edmund gets some lunch. It's tangerines on, I assume, a tree. So I drew tangerines on a tree. There's no line work, which I'm quite happy with. Um, this one was from my mum. The girl held the tiny flower in her hand, feeling the gentle petals slipping from her grasp. She was about to look away and look back at the vastness she had just been staring into, when she heard a sound from above her, like a little cough or a clearing of throat. She looked up and saw a small, fluffy head looking down at her. She reached up and took Edmund from the branch and placed him on the floor. He nodded in thanks and began walking towards a tangerine tree that had sprouted amongst the twisted trees around them. The girl tried to stop him, but Edmund began to climb up the trunk to the tangerines. He wasn't very good at climbing and immediately slid back down. He looked dejected. She reached up and picked a tangerine, laying it on the ground next to Edmund. He nodded again, looking suddenly the happiest he could, and bit into it. There you go, day eight. How many more have we got? This one, my windmill from my mum again. Not not that happy with it, but, you know, I'm okay that I did it, that kind of thing. Notice the orange flowers, the pink. Ooh, foreshadowing that I didn't know I did. <clears throat> anyway. As Edmund chomped into his tangerine, the girl stood and moved away, suddenly realising that it was a strange little fluffy thing with feathers growing out of its head talking to her. She was concerned. But her path ahead was now blocked by a tall, sprawling building with an arched door around which the tangerines were now growing. Oh, they're tangerines. There you go. It was a windmill with stubby little sails swinging around the top and three small windows staring down at her. She stopped, she stopped back. She stood back. I think I'm supposed to be she stood back. I wrote these really quickly. She stood back and tried to get the little fluffy thing's attention. But Edmund was still digging into his lunch, his fluff becoming sticky and the smile becoming full. And day 10, everything in the garden is roses. This is really, really where I start just taking liberties with the prompts my family gave me. Now the idea of everything's fine, everything's fine, and you just keep telling yourself and you ignore, ignore, ignore. That is what she is doing. Edmund finally finished his tangerine, was very happy about this. He looked up at the girl and said, hello. She stared down at him and said, hello, not knowing what to do with a tiny fluffy thing greeting her. I'm Edmund, he said, and these are my feathers. He lifted a strand of his bright blue feathers for her to admire. Nice, she said. I'm... I can't remember, she realised. I can't remember my name. And you have no feathers, Edmund said wistfully. The girl stood confused for a moment and then turned back to the windmill in front of her. It seemed so inviting, with its bright tangerine circling the friendly arched door. The girl worried. The girl, worried by Edmund's stature, scooped him up, he didn't seem to mind, and knocked on the door. A voice inside said, come in, so she did, not knowing what else to do. Inside was not like outside. It was dark. Shadows threw themselves across everything, draping the room in odd distilled shapes. In the centre was an unnerving figure who began to move towards them. It's all right said a shaking, high-pitched voice. It's all going to be all right. I forgot it was high-pitched. The figure came suddenly into view, her face pushing through the shadows and appearing pink, unreal and grinning. Everything in the garden is roses, she said, leering at the girl. It's all still roses. It can all be fixed. I just have to break you first. And the figure leapt at the girl. Ooh, figure. And then we have day 11, which is SBG, Vivian's hamster from The Young Ones. I did my best. He's kind of a grouchy looking hamster. But day 11, as the woman leapt at Edmund and the girl, the lights sprang on, showing the bedraggled room, faded wallpaper and scuffed floors, broken furniture, unloved and unnoticed for what seemed like years. The room was disintegrating. There was a tiny sound, a scuffling across the floorboards, and then a shape about the size of Edmund flew across the air at the woman. A well-aimed but tiny karate kick slammed into her cheek, knocking her off balance and away from the girl. 
Call me Cliff. One, I can't, this is supposed to be in Scottish. I can't do a Scottish accent. Call me Cliff one more time, ye little wimp. That was my, my attempt. That's actually a line. Anyway, he yelled in a thick Scottish accent. He was brandishing a saucepan. It's another bit from, from another episode. A tiny little saucepan and began beating the woman's toes vigorously. The girl took this chance to escape, holding tightly to the confused Edmund as she turned and ran from the windmill back into the thickening gardening garden around them. And yes, I've, I've changed desks. There's people in the lounge and the TV's on and they just laugh at me. So I'll come to my office. Anyway, day 12, happiness. The girl walked along with Edmund, away from the windmill and the strange things inside. The night began to wrap around them and the further she walked, the thicker the garden became. Soon it was a forest, cutting off the path behind them as they moved forward. As she walked, holding the cute little fluffy Edmund close to her, feeling his subtle weight falling into her neck as he slipped into a contented sleep, she felt something uncomfortable moving around in her stomach. With Edmund in one hand and the tiny flower in the other, she couldn't hold herself. She couldn't hold herself to protect against this new feeling. I don't know what I meant there. She couldn't hold herself to the what? With Edmund in one hand and the tiny flower in the other, she couldn't hold, she couldn't hold herself. Oh, she couldn't cuddle herself. Okay. Yeah, that needed to be, I wrote this quickly. I'm trying. Then she thought, why would I want to protect myself against it? She realized that this feeling, uncomfortable and strange as it was, was also warm. So she let it begin to a slow, certain climb up through her body to the corners of her mouth, which curled in, up into a smile. The girl allowed this unrecognised happiness to warm her, to keep her warm and make her stride wider and to appreciate the gentle purr in her ear from Edmund's snore. Ah, yes, happiness can be an uncomfortable feeling if you're not used to it. Next we have day 13 and we have... Well, I read it as in the Kevin, as in Kevin. This is call me Kevin, it's supposed to be. But actually, this is my son's, he meant the Kevin Cinematic Universe, the KCU, which is that, kind of. Um, it's a whole thing, but I went with Kevin. So, day 13. As the girl walked along, the sky around her became darker, the trees reaching out their distorted branches, her mind wandered. She wondered what had brought her to this what had brought her to this walking along a strange land holding a broken flower and a little fluffy sleeping thing. She had often thought, the bad decision after bad decision, that she was actually just a character in a game and someone wasn't playing it very seriously. That's Kevin. Someone was giggling as they pressed the buttons, and she, whoever she was, had to walk wherever the cursor told her to. She looked up at the sky and imagined the Kevin, that's what, what I did the Kevin, looking down at her. At least he smiled at her. That was a good sign, right? Now the next one was the wind through the grass. Um, I cocked it up, I tried. I, I used these other pens, these Karen markers, and I cannot figure the things out. So I just faffed about. This is just stuff I drew after, and then I drew that, and then this is copied from the internet. I have no idea who the original artist was, but that's blatantly copied. Um, and then I drew, I was going to do with a character. It, it was In the end, it was the lightning tree walking through. So, yeah, we'll just ignore day 14's drawings because they're rubbish. Um, but the story behind them, a long way down the path, but still a lot closer than it had been, the lightning tree lumbered on. It could feel the break in front, and it knew that this is what it needed to find, so the lightning tree moved on with resolve. But as it went further away from its stark desert and further into the countryside around it, it found the resolve slipping from its thoughts and allowed the colours and sounds and texture beneath its roots fill its mind. It listened to the birds above and watched the grass blowing in the wind. It continued on, continued onwards, but with less and less grumpiness with each movement. So we'll just get to that one. Next we have my sons, written in Korean, which is great fun. 
to find out but essentially hopefully fingers crossed it says friendship so the lightning tree finally caught up with him them that's supposed to be them almost like the forest around them shortened to let them along the girl found herself in front of this huge tree as its grumpy face looked down at her but it seemed to smile a little so she risked a smile back Edmund woke up and stretched, wondering why there was a big tree staring at him. The girl took Edmund from her shoulder and held him up to the tree. Edmund, who had been taught to always be polite, held out his hand to the tree, only slightly wondering if the tree had a hand to shake. The tree proffered its thinnest branch to Edmund, and the two shook on their new friendship. The girl smiled even more. Unfortunately, some marker came through from the next page but again we'll ignore that the next one was silence and first i was doing this and then i I'd done it here and then i drew it here and then i realized oh this tree makes one big tree and then this was my boyfriend's prompt and he was thinking library so this actually comes later in the story but that's that's what i did for silence and then the story is the three of them began to walk through the forest, not knowing where they needed to go, but knowing that they were together in this now. Night fell, and it seemed that they were coming to an edge of the forest, but the trees parted in front of them, giving them two different paths they could take. One led to a library, filled with books of different colours. A lone chair sat in front of a bookcase, just the size for the girl. It was cosy, and the girl was drawn to it. She felt she could sit for hours and days and years and think about everything she needed to learn. To the right, the path led out of the forest and on towards some mountains. They couldn't see what was beyond them. Both were in silence. Both would give them time to think and wander, and they had to choose. Edmund didn't really mind, but he didn't want to interrupt the other two, so he curled up on the girl's shoulder and fell asleep again. Next we have another in Korean from my son and it says love. So I just I think I was working this day so I had to do really, really quick ones. So I just did two, two quick ones. She plants the uh, flower and she's looking at it. So as the night appeared around them, they decided to rest. Edmund curled up into a little nook in the lightning tree's branches and the lightning tree settled its roots back into the ground. The girl looked at the tiny flower in her hand. Its roots were drooping to the ground as if it wanted to reach the soil beneath it. She knelt down and dug a hole into the ground with her hand and gently lowered the flower's roots into it. It seemed to settle and she leaned down to it, watching its tiny broken thing stretch slightly. The flower looked up at the girl and two new petals unfurled towards her. They watched each other, each growing in their own ways. day 18 and we have moonwalk and a mistake can you see that that's a that's another bit of paper stuck on top because i tried to use this um gold ready gold ink and it didn't work so again we just ignore that and we move on so day 18 from my dad moonwalk thanks dad as they slept a distant figure appeared on the horizon the moon was huge that night round and bright and lit the ground beneath it the figure seemed to float just above the ground as if avoiding the moon's light. The rose woman raced towards them, her manic grin growing, her eyes widening, a fresh orange rose clipped to her dainty white blouse. She would not allow it. She could not allow it. Everything was roses, everything was fine, and how dare this girl show differently. Rose continued her moonwalk, floating her way closer to them. She's walking in the moonlight, so it's a moonwalk. That's what I did. And then we have, I believe, my daughter again. Um, yes, yeah, so we have Riker's Thigh. We're very into Riker's Thigh in our household. I, I explained it all in the video for this particular one. Again, cannot do people, but I tried my best. You get the idea. And there is Riker's Thigh. I swear it powers the Enterprise. It really does. But they slept on, not knowing the threat that hurtled towards them. Their sleep was a deep and satisfying one. They felt calm and protected, even though... I put thought, but we'll ignore that, even though they slept out in the open. They didn't know that, having beamed down straight from the bridge, Commander William T. Riker towered above them, his thigh prominent and radiating, a thigh of pure power, strength and ultimate manliness. 
He stood over them as they slept, the warmth from his thigh covering them like the manliest blanket ever created. Maybe if O'Brien had been there, they would have felt even safer, but Riker's thigh was good enough and very, very manly. It's a whole thing in our house, best not to ask, really. Uh, then I missed a page because that, and then that needs to start sticking down. Next, we have from my dad, Barbecue. If only there hadn't been an incident on Deep Space Nine and a bit. As in Deep Space Nine and a bit. I thought it was funny. If only Captain Picard hadn't been Riker back to the Emperor Enterprise before sunup, because that is when Rose found their sleeping bodies. She grinned down at them, her smile widening even more, until part of her face began to split around her skull. She whipped out a barbecue and began to light it, the coals just beginning to glow orange. As they awoke, the girl gazed up to see her there, floating, cackling that everything was all right and always would be, holding a tiny pitchfork in one hand and a sinister string of sausages in the other. I want to make you breakfast, Rose said. It's Rose. And then we have uh, the 21st of October, which is Back to the Future Day as well, people, so I had to get a DeLorean in there. But the, uh, the, the prop... The prompt was cup half full, so you're thinking optimism and stuff, I guess, is the idea. Another one from my dad. Uh, they stood in front of this sausage-wielding, floating woman, Edmund slowly crawling up the girl's arm to her shoulder. The girl backed up, the happiness she'd been feeling seeping away. This was it. She would be barbecued and turn into bacon slices. Her cup was finally empty. But then she heard a low roar. Just to her left... There was a rumbling sound, and she moved her eyes to see a DeLorean waiting for them. The lightning tree knew what it needed to do. This is why it had been called. The DeLorean needed to help to make it through this strange land. Gas and banana peels wouldn't do it alone. It's a bit from the third film. Anyway, the lightning tree began to spark and shot a bolt of lightning straight at the DeLorean. The girl scooped up the flower and held on to Edmund as she raced, raced to the DeLorean. Rose screaming at her as she needed a nutritious breakfast first. True as this was, the girl didn't stop. She jumped into the DeLorean, now shining blue, and pulled away, tyres screeching across the ground. She just caught a glimpse of the lightning tree behind her, settling back into the ground. She nodded to it, and it seemed to wave a branch back to her. So I quite like that, that you know. The whole lightning thing, it, it came full circle. And again, I missed the page because I didn't protect the page when I was doing it before. And we have day 22. The prompt, Miss Piggy and Timmy hanging out, looking fly. Timmy is our dog. And I had to put the DeLorean in there as well. Anyway, as the girl and Edmund zoomed by, Rose floating behind them in hot pursuit, she glanced out of the window at the meadows around her and mountains ahead. She saw many things, even though she was racing, and began to recognise everything that was around her, everything that existed, the possibilities, the chances, the wonderful things. Maybe somewhere, Miss Piggy and Timmy were together, hanging out, looking fly. She moved towards the mountains, slowly pulling away from Rose behind them, with little Edmund curled up on her shoulder, and she smiled. Well, there you go, Miss Piggy. Timmy the dog. Next we have heaven on earth. So I drew my cats because that's pretty nice. So we got the cats, six cats and two dogs. Just, just don't, right? Just don't. There's a whole story. I tell it in the other video. I didn't mean to, but cats kind of happen to you very much like Prince does. So day 23, soon they lost Rose, but the girl was sure she was still following them. She pulled over for a moment. Edmund was hungry and looking at her in an accusatory way. There was a small grove of cherry trees near them, with the reddest flowers she'd ever seen. She hoped to find some actual cherries for Edmund, so she walked towards it. A sudden feeling of calm came over her, a sense that she was right where she should be. As she walked into the grove, she started seeing little shapes in the branches. Six cats curled their way through the trees, playing with the red flowers and snuggling up to each other. 
on the ground two log dogs lay together warming each other they do that it's adorable it was heaven on earth edmund reached out for one of the red flowers and started eating it he seemed happy so the girls settled there for a while next we have another one from my son justice for boromir he's not happy with this this isn't what he meant i don't know what he wanted but that's boromir honest and then you've got you've got pippin and merry <laughs> pippin and merry and and they're holding hero signs with arrows towards boromir and there's more arrows because um, I think in the other one I said he got hit by 20 arrows. Actually, he got, he got hit by three arrows. Um, so possibly the arrows weren't, you know, the most thoughtful choice. But that's the idea. And this was the um, art snacks box for, uh, for October that I used for this one. So the girl sat by one of the trees, a little cat asleep on her lap, and Edmund curled up next to her. She began to drift and daydream. She thought about all the things that mattered to her at once, that had mattered to her once, but had slipped her mind when she hurt the flower. She had planted it in front of her, and one more petal sprouted. It seemed to be stronger, and she was too. She had broken. She had fallen down. She remembered giving up and letting a strange, painful force drag her further into the ground. It was heavy on her even now, but she had stood up and held the little flower, and was, she was helping it grow strong again. Any one of us can fall, but it's how we pull ourselves back up that shows us who we are. We are heroes if we choose. Justice for Boromir, she thought to herself, and drifted off to sleep. Because he'd, he'd fallen and tried to take the ring, but then he redeemed himself for trying to save Merry and Pippin. That was my idea. Day 25 and we had a quick one because I had to get to work quick and a very short story, Comfort from my boyfriend. Uh, Edmund slept soundly in comfort. With the cats ringing him to keep him warm, he dreamt of purple glitter and huge tangerines. He smiled. He's a simple fellow, is our little Edmund. Next, another quick one that I actually really like. I realise I haven't rubbed the uh, pencil mark off yet, so that needs to happen. This was from my mum, and for some reason she wanted a cross-eyed kitten. Okay, I did this with the red ink that came from the sketchbox box for October, I think. So, day 26, the girl woke up, still surrounded by the deep red flowers, and little Edmund all curled up, up in comfort. She sat up and rubbed her eyes. Sitting in front of her was a kitten. One that she hadn't seen the night before. It was tiny and with cross eyed that stared at each other. Hello, it said. Hello, she said, not letting herself be too surprised by this. Who are you? The question is, said this wise sounding yet squeaky voice, who are you? The girl thought about this. It had been a confusing time, talking trees and fluffy little feathered things, terrifying flying people and questionable barbecues. I don't know, she said. The kitten moved its head to one side, as if appraising her. Of course you do, it said. At the end of everything, we always know ourselves. Name yourself, and you'll see. It stood, turned and walked away, seemingly disappearing into the red flowers. The girl thought about it, and one name sprung into her mind, like an arrow piercing her three times, from Boromir the three times thing. Rose, she whispered. <gasps> dum, dum, dum! <clears throat> anyway, next we have day 27 and foam on sea, which I think is for my mum and she meant me to draw some sea. I can't draw sea, so this is the town foam on sea, which is, I don't know if, where, if you do that anywhere else, but if a town is by the sea, it's on sea. That's what I did. So Rose stood, grabbed Edmund, who pretty much just stayed asleep, and the flower, and began moving forward. She had more energy in her step, more willingness to exist. Maybe it was this added intent on her part, but suddenly she found herself home. But not her home, really. It was a multicoloured version. The buildings all still there, but as if somebody had painted over them, in a flowy and loose style, of course. 
She walked along the streets that would lead her to her home, surrounded by pink and blue buildings and bright green shrubs. As she reached her front door, she heard something behind her, a dullness, a weight bringing her back down. She felt her stomach lurch as she turned to see other rows staring at her. As this is based on Port Marion, is the idea anyway. So, day 28. Oh, we're almost, almost done to the end. Day 28, hell on earth. Again, thanks, Dad. It was pretty good, you know, timing where I, I pulled order that I, uh, I pulled these out. So there you go. As Rose saw her counterpart, the town began to shift. It became a jumble of distorted grey shapes. Her home turned from the fantasy picture she had seen, the pretty colours and bright plants, into a vision of hell on earth. Her home lost to her, it seemed, as she and Rose stared at each other, each with their faces falling along with the town. And, ooh, look, the, both the flowers, the pink and the orange one. Oh, what's going to happen to them? Ooh. Day 29, and then we have Chief O'Brien, my son again. There we go. My son. I'm pretty sure the Riker one was my son. He just uh, switched pens on me. But day 29, it's okay because Chief O'Brien is here. I know it's not very good, but I'm very proud of how I did his cheeks and then used a bit of pink. So Chief O'Brien, everybody. And this up, this up, this, this is supposed to be a dartboard. It just went really bad and I gave up. So he's basically down the pub, bit of Guinness. And this, if anyone see the last episode of Deep Space Nine, this is the little, the little um, model that Julian leaves for him. It's very moving. But day 29, Rose had to do something. She could no longer hide behind this pain, this lost version of herself. She couldn't lash out whenever anything became difficult or fall to the ground and ignore it. She, I've spelled that wrong, she needed a face up to her issues. Only then could she fix them all. She remembered a moment of clarity, a simple mantra from a time before all this. Something she learned from the greatest hero she had ever known, Chief Miles O'Brien. She would take this version of herself to the pub. She would get in a round and they would play darts. That would fix everything. That would fix her world. She would talk, she would listen and they would be whole again. And it would be all thanks to Chief O'Brien, the wonderful Chief O'Brien. My God, we love Chief O'Brien. It's again, it's a family thing. It's best not to ask. Day 30, yesterday, and this was books. Rose found herself back in her lounge and realized that this is where her story had truly begun. Staring at an empty page, at the rows of books behind her, she recognized that she had been missing so much from her life for so long. Now she'd sat in a green chair, sipping cocoa from her yellow mug, having stare started the page, knowing what she needed to do in her life and knowing that she was scared of it, but that was okay. It was in a way needed. The story of Edmund the Strumple lay in her notebook and she knew she would finish it this time. And then who knows? Outside, the pink and the orange flowers grew, some broken from when she had ran from the house in fear and sadness, but so many more growing strong. So there's the oh, pink and the orange, and this is back to the silence one. So that was like a distorted version of her lounge, but she wasn't ready to go back yet. And the last page I did earlier today, Freddie Freaker, call now at this number from my daughter. Thanks, Eleanor. She wanted me to draw Freddy Freaker and I just, it was like, oh, but this is Edmund. I've got to do what Edmund's doing. So I did Edmund and a Freddy Frith. It's a whole thing. Google Freddy Freaker. You will be none the wiser if you do, but it might be interesting. But anyway, this is what I did. Day 31. And as for Edmund, he recognised his part in all this. How the wonder of his feathers brought two strange tall people back together. How his smile had calmed them and brought them the happiness. Edmund knew what he had to do. With the help of the artist formerly known as Prince, he set up his own happy company, where he would share his smile and occasionally his feathers with whomever needed him. And everyone, especially Edmund the Fluffy Strumple, lived happily ever after. Well, there were some ups and downs for Rose, but that's life, and she learned to deal with them. So any downs simply helped her helps her appreciate the ups 
and Edmund sends her one of his feathers every year on her birthday, so that helps too. The end. So there you go. That is my Doomtober for the year 2020. How fitting. But anyway, thank you very much if you watched all this. That took me ages. I kept having to stop and start and move. But anyway, thank you very much. I will hopefully see you whatever comes next. My new pa November, I assume, palafall pack has just been delivered today. So it's probably be, be that. And some NaNoWriMo action. But anyway, if you made it this far, please like. Please subscribe if you haven't. All of that YouTube stuff. It would be awesome of you. And I will hopefully see you next time for whatever comes. Bye.